It seems that nobody wants to get in on the pre-construction condo game anymore in Toronto because they're on pace to see the worst year of new construction sales in Toronto in nearly a decade. Hey everyone, my name is Matthew Pfeiffer, real estate agent in Regina. That's my trust assistant, Matilda. This is the weekly news recap here on Bald Prairie Real Estate, where I go through the week's most interesting Canadian real estate related news topics and give you my thoughts and opinions. We're going to be talking about what's going on in that Toronto pre-construction space. Plus, CMHC is out saying that mortgage delinquency rates still are at near historic lows. Benjamin Tal, chief economist from the CIBC, is saying that they don't think they're going to see the Bank of Canada drop interest rates until the summer of 2024. We're going to be talking about the Government of Canada's plan to cap immigration at 500,000 and a whole bunch of great topics I've got here this week. But as always, let's start off with another one of my terrible bad dad jokes. I don't know if you know, but recently my pet obese parrot passed away. But on the bright side, it's a big weight off my shoulder. If you have a terrible joke that I can use in a future episode, put in the comments below. Let's get into this week's news. Starting off with Ontario removing their portion of HST from the construction of purpose-built rentals. This is something that I've been asking for for a while. Stop taxing new construction because that's a huge part of what's making housing in Canada unaffordable. If you look at the cost to build a house in Canada, about 25 to 35 percent of that cost is taxes and fees levied by the government. So at least now we've got the federal government removing the GST on purpose-built rentals and now Ontario is matching that by removing their portion of their HST from purpose-built rentals. I do wish that this was spread out across all types of residential property so we'd start removing these taxes and fees but we also know that the governments are pretty addicted to how much money that they make on these new construction projects. You take land transfer taxes and development fees and everything else. This is massive business. In Toronto alone, I believe land transfer tax is closing in on $2 billion a year in revenue. This is massive for different provinces and different municipalities that have municipal land transfer taxes. So. It's good that we're starting to see things going in the right direction. Removing HST and GST altogether on rentals, purpose-built rentals in Toronto, for example, is going to take the cost of, say, a $500,000 duplex. It's going to knock off about $60,000 in taxes and fees. So it's going to make that project more affordable. And we might start seeing more projects get built because there's a lot that have been put on the shelf because of how expensive new construction is. And because of interest rates, these projects just simply aren't financially viable. This might tip a few back into that viable and we might start seeing a little bit more construction getting going. Next, CMHC says that mortgage arrears are at historic lows. For those that don't know, banks and lenders in Canada are required to let CMHC know when mortgage holders are delinquent on these mortgages. Now, prior to the pandemic, we were already at basically historic lows where the delinquency rate in Canada was about 0.3%. And to put some context to that, in the United States, prior to the pandemic, they were about three to 5%, significantly higher than where we were in Canada. And to give you more context, prior to the 2008 financial crisis and all the stuff that went on there, their mortgage delinquency rate on those variable rate kind of teaser subprime mortgages was between 35 and 40%. Again, Canada was 0.3 prior to the pandemic. It bottomed out last year at 0.15%. It's climbed back up to 0.16%. I actually expected this to continue to increase, and I still continue to expect this to increase throughout the year. I'm surprised it's not higher. I'm surprised we haven't got back to pre-pandemic levels. I do think we're going to get there. Now, it is important to note that the majority of mortgage holders have not seen higher interest rates yet because they were locked in to higher interest rates prior to the Bank of Canada starting to raise interest rates. And we've seen how what's going on with the bond market. Of course, it's gone crazy. It started to kind of settle back down a little bit here in the last couple of days. But the majority of those mortgage holders aren't going to feel the pain until next year. So 2024 and 2025. That's when we have a lot of mortgage holders going to be renewing into higher interest rates. Now, you're going to see lots of headlines about how you know 40 or 50 percent of mortgage holders are going to renew in those two years. And that kind of makes sense. Typically in Canada, we do five year terms. So approximately 20% of mortgage holders will renew each and every single year. 
So it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what happens with people renewing into these higher interest rates, but also keeping track of delinquency rates. That's something I always watch and I will continue to update you as we get more information. This information typically is a little bit slow to come out, but when it does, I'll always be talking about it. If you want to kind of an idea as to what's going with other types of delinquencies, so auto loans, credit cards, you can go right on the Bank of Canada's website. They have an area called Financial Indicators and you can keep track of that. Now it had been trending up through the year. It seems to have plateaued off a little bit in the summer. We'll have to see what happens this fall. Again, I was a little surprised to see that plateau. I expected that to continue increasing as people stop paying for mortgage or stop paying for car payments and credit cards long before they stop paying for the mortgages. So we'll keep track of all that and I'll update you guys as there's more information. Now let's talk about the government of Canada's immigration targets, which have been under fire recently as a lot of people are saying they're unsustainable. And I am one of those people that's saying that our immigration policy is not matching up with our construction policy. And I need to make this very clear. I'm not against immigration. I welcome those that would like to make Canada the new home. But we also need to make sure that that immigration policy lines up with our ability to build homes because we just simply don't have those two in sync right now. And you're seeing it. Look at what's going on with the rental market. Look how hard it is to find a place to rent and look how much rent has gone up because of how much demand there is. We can build somewhere in the neighborhood of about 250 to 275,000 homes in a busy year in Canada. And we're likely not gonna see that this year because many projects are put on the shelf with how much interest are up. These projects simply aren't financially viable anymore. When you add in temporary foreign workers and then the student visas, now you're talking you know, well into 1.5 million people going to be coming to Canada every year looking for housing. And we simply can't build anywhere near enough housing to keep up with that demand. So the government's saying, well, we're gonna cap it at 500,000 and they've been putting a little pressure to try to slow down student visas. It's very superficial. They're saying the university basically has to prove that they should be there and that they're valuable. It's a rubber stamp process. They're really not clamping down on things. But when they talk about capping it at 500,000 for permanent residents, because that's all this is, is just capping for permanent residents, you have to remember that from 2000 to 2015, we had been really consistent in Canada at about 250,000 new permanent residents each and every single year. And it's now been doubled to 500,000 and we have not seen construction anywhere near doubling. So we just simply cannot keep up with the demand for housing right now in Canada. And that's gonna to continue to put pressure on the rental market and pressure on housing overall long-term. Next, let's talk about Benjamin Tal saying, we will not see the Bank of Canada drop interest rates until the summer of 2024. So pretty much every single time that somebody says, we're gonna see interest rates drop or rise, I try to talk about it on this channel. And as you've seen, these predictions are all over the place. We've seen some people are saying they were gonna drop this year. I was one of those. I expected rates to drop in the back half this year and we haven't seen that. There's some people saying we're not going to see rates drop until the end of 2025. That's a pretty big range. And it's why I continue to say, please do not base your decision on buying a house on a forecast, whether it's where prices are going or where interest rates are going, because you don't have a plan, then you have a hope or a dream of something coming true. So Again, I'll stress it, you buy a house when it makes sense for your own personal situation. But if you look at what the market is doing right now, they're starting to price in rate cuts all the way through to 2025 and potentially as much as 1.5% by the end of 2025. Again, nobody knows where the heck interest rates are going to be next year, let alone in 2025. Benjamin Tal is saying that he does not think that they're going to drop rates until the summer of 2024 at the earliest. And Benjamin Tal is a really smart guy. It's somebody you definitely want to keep an eye on what he has to say because he's usually been pretty on the beat of what's going on and had a pretty good feel for kind of where things are going. Again, nobody knows where they're going. But he did make a really interesting point and the Bank of Canada has started to basically telegraph this. And he was saying that he thinks the Bank of Canada is going to start dropping interest rates before they hit that inflation target of 2%. He figures if we start seeing 2.5, 2.4, 2.3, you know, and trending down, that you'll see the Bank of Canada start dropping interest rates. And they've basically been telegraphing that already, saying that they may drop interest rates before they get to that target. So while everybody's watching what's going on with inflation, and right now, most recent data was it was at 3.8%. 
It has been trending down, especially in that core section. That's what the Bank of Canada continues to talk about, what they're watching. So we're going to have to wait and see what the Bank of Canada does because it's one thing to look at what they do. It's very important to look at what they say. Even with this most recent pause that they did, they specifically said if inflation continues to trend up, they will raise interest rates. So again, watch what the Bank of Canada does, but also listen to what they say. Now let's talk about the Toronto pre-construction market where things aren't looking very good. So with less than 10,000 new construction condos sold this year, they're on pace for the worst year in a decade. And really, this doesn't surprise me at all. For basically a decade, people have seen the pre-construction market as a guaranteed winner. Put money in, get more out. For those that don't understand the way this process works, people will go to the builder they will buy these condos and buy i put in quotations there because essentially they buy the contract to purchase it and it's typically you know two three four years until these projects are ready to actually be occupied as they get closer to being ready for occupancy the people that have purchased these agreements of sale will then try to flip these out to somebody else who's going to actually live in these projects and of course hopefully at a profit. And for the last 10 years, it's been basically every single time, almost a guaranteed winner. There's nothing in investing, nothing in real estate's guaranteed, but that's what's been happening. People have made pretty good money. Now, I understand people look at people that are doing this as awful, horrible people because they're speculating on real estate. Also, the builder needs these people to buy these projects. Because again, for those that don't know kind of the way projects that get financed and how they get off the ground, the builder is going to need a set number of pre-sales before they will get construction financing. So if they don't have these investors that come in and buy these while they're in this pre-construction phase, because many people that are going to occupy these simply don't have the capacity to buy and wait two, three, four years before moving in. That's what investors come in and kind of fill that gap. Even if you look at the project in Toronto, the one that went bankrupt recently, they had about 80% of their units pre-sold. So there was demand for these. And we see this pretty much across the country. It's not just Toronto. You're going to need usually 50, 60, 70% pre-sales before a bank's going to fund the construction. So this is a necessity to actually get these projects built. But we have been seeing the ugly side of pre-construction this past year, two years, because many of these projects that are now completed they're not worth what these people paid two or three years ago in some cases, and they're unable to sell them and make money on them, so they're taking a loss. And in some cases, these buyers never intend to actually take possession of these units. They never went and got financing because they weren't worried about it. They were going to just flip these units out, so they didn't care about financing. They just signed their name on the dotted line. Well, now it's kind of rubber meets the road, and they have to actually close on these units if they can't get them flipped out to somebody else. And that's where we're seeing a whole bunch of issues because simply put, there are people that cannot qualify for these mortgages. They couldn't qualify for them originally potentially, and they definitely can't with higher interest rates and they can't sell them and get out of them for what they put in. So if you look at my monthly Canadian real estate market update, I talk about the glut of inventory in Toronto and a huge, huge portion of that is these pre-construction condos that are sitting there that people just can't get out from underneath. And another reason that we're seeing the lack of pre-construction sales is because there's also far fewer projects that are being built right now. About a dozen or so major projects in Toronto have been put on the shelf because they're not financially viable anymore. So they're just not even available to be sold. So again, combining lack of people actually starting these projects to begin with and the buyers just not wanting to buy these pre-construction sales we are seeing a huge drop in this number of new construction sales happening this year in Toronto. Now, speaking of buying a house in Canada, of course, if you're in Regina, I would love to help you out and Matilda will come along for the showings. But if you're anywhere else in Canada and you don't already have a great real estate agent, I can set you up with a fantastic one. If you look in the description of this video, there's gonna be a link to my calendar where you can book me in for a buyer's consultation. I'll call you up, learn about what's important to you in buying a house, but also in a real estate agent and I might get you set up with the best agent for you in your market. And if you want to learn, 
And if you want to learn even more about what's going on in the market, right here is my most recent Canadian real estate market update. If you love this video, please give this video a like, subscribe to Ball Prairie Real Estate if you haven't already, leave me some comments so we can chat in the comment section below. And as always, thanks very much for watching.